it's useful. Yeah. I haven't Stay the familiar transcript with it, and then this year, um, yep, I just enabled it. Okay, everyone, well, we'll get started. I want to welcome everyone, family, friends, students, and colleagues. Thank you for joining us today during Autism Acceptance Month. You'll see many of us wearing blue today in honor of Autism Acceptance Month, really to celebrate the life and the work of Dr. Li Ching Li. She was a dedicated autism and developmental disability researcher and a teacher who was beloved by her family, students, colleagues from around the globe. She was smart and hardworking, strong and resilient, and was the most compassionate and kind-hearted person I've ever known. No doubt these qualities contributed to her success in life and academia, where she rose to the rank of senior scientist in the Department of Epidemiology with joint appointments in mental health in the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And she also became the Associate Director for Global Autism Research at the Wenda Clegg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities here at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Li Ching was born in Taiwan and earned her medical degree from Kaohsiung Medical University before coming to the United States to pursue her graduate education. She earned a master's degree from the Department of Mental Hygiene, which is now named the Department of Mental Health, uh, and her PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Departments of Epidemiology and Maternal and Child Health. During her career, she authored over 110 peer-reviewed publications. She was editor for Autism, the International Journal of Research and Practice, and served on over 20 grant review panels for multiple federal organizations as well as private foundations. For over a decade, she served as the principal investigator for the Maryland site of the Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, also known as ADAM for short, which is the network that reports the US autism prevalence rates every few years. She's also led as PI many other autism and developmental disability projects around the world from Taiwan to Bangladesh to Beijing, China. And she also served as co-investigator on several other projects seeking to improve the lives of children and their families. For her scientific contributions, Li Ching also received the Diversity Award from the International Society for Autism Research, which recognizes research that's made a significant impact on cultural diversity and underserved communities beyond the scope of any one single project. And then finally, in addition to her research, she had a major impact on teaching and training. She was co-director for two courses on public health approaches in autism and developmental disabilities, and was an instructor for courses on epidemiologic inference in public health, which she taught during the academic year, as well as in the school's summer institute programs. These courses consistently received the Johns Hopkins Excellent in Teaching, Excellence in Teaching Awards year after year. She also advised over 45 students during her tenure, and for her outstanding service to students, she received the AMTRA Award given by the Student Assembly of our school for her excellence in advising, teaching, and mentoring. In recognition of these strengths, both in autism, epidemiology, and public health, her passion to develop and bring the best autism screening, diagnostic tools, and research to global populations, and her dedication to teaching and training the next generation of researchers. Today, the committee has organized three sessions in honor of that, one in each of these topic areas. The first session uh, will have a keynote address by Dr. Craig Newshafer that will really highlight some autism epidemiology and public health. Second session will be from a longtime collaborator and colleague, Kathy Rice, um, focused more on global autism research. And then finally, the third session will be dedicated to recognizing her teaching and mentorship with some lightning talks from two of her advisees, as well as a panel for students on training and mentorship. Before beginning the first session, we'd like to share with you a short video about the remarkable person Li Ching was and her many contributions to life.
My name is JJ Lee. I am Li Qin's niece. She was uh, one of the first people I met, except for my parents. She took care of me when my parents were busy for work and encouraged me to come to the United States for my education. I always follow her steps as far as I remember. She was not only my aunt, my best friend, and the inspiration of my life. She was the um, most generous and supportive person one would ever dream of. As a family, a friend, and a colleague, Li Qin treasured so much about the family and loved to organize parties, gatherings, and celebrations. She would take six to eight kids with age between six to 12 years old to public libraries. My cousins and siblings dream of visiting Li Qin with older kids for summer camps in where that's how we called it back then in Kaohsiung where um, Li Qin went to college. There were always negotiations and arguments among kids in who got to go for trips with her even when Li Qin was in US. She often remotely organized so many events for my family in Taiwan, she could come up tons of reasons to celebrate with, fam with family. Her kindness was beyond anyone could ever imagine. We all miss her so much and terribly every day. They were mornings that I woke up and wishes of losing her was a bad dream in the previous nights. Li Qin was the first in the family to pursue education, to go to college, to come to the United States for higher education and career. She told stories about um, sneaking out of a family house to go to school, but got punished because of that. She worked multiple jobs in order to afford education at Hopkins. She dedicated her career to promote the awareness of and the research in children's mental health. The family has been extremely proud of her. Her vision and determination changes our lives forever, especially for the younger generations. I could think of hundreds of Li Qin's stories and share our memory of beloved aunts. Please join us to celebrate her life and continue her legacy. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy Choi. I first met Li Qin when she came to interview for the doctoral program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We later reconnected as faculty colleagues at Hopkins. I'd like to share a trait that I think best captures Li Qing's spirit. To me, she personified determination, the quality of tenacity over life or persisting to exist. Li Qing was born as the fourth and youngest daughter of five siblings, born into significant impoverishment and with genu verum or bow legs. Her bone disorder was considered a bad omen, especially for females. This did not deter Li Qing in life, and she went on to forge a path as an exceptional, productive, and accomplished academic epidemiologist at the leading school of public health. She had an act active network of collaborators and an outstanding record of sponsored research. She accomplished all of this on her own as a single Asian female distance from the embrace of family and the comforts of cultural touchstones. She assumed financial responsibility for her parents. Our tragedy was that she could not escape an illness that eventually overcame her and robbed her of many more years of life. Li Qing was loved by her friends all over. 
She never disclosed how much she was hurting, especially in her final months of life. She pursued her autism research indefatigably through countless physician consultations, clinic visits, exhausting treatments, surgery, and from her hospital bed. She leaves a legacy of scientific insights into the prevalence and developmental conditions of autism, autism spectrum disorder among children. She also leaves behind a devoted niece, other family, friends, students, and colleagues, all bereft of her generous spirit, compassion, and love. May the memory of her world-class persona permeate hearts and minds, as well as inspire more scientific understanding into child development conditions, including autism. Thank you. Li Ching was a fantastic colleague and great friend uh, to me personally, to the Wendy Clegg Center here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, I had the privilege of co-teaching, really co-developing and then co-teaching an autism in public health course with Li Ching. She was really excited to put together such a course almost a decade ago when we decided that the Wendy Clegg Center should offer such a thing at the Bloomberg School. and. Um, she immediately had ideas for what kinds of topics should be in there and was eager to work with me to come up with our own lectures and lectures of others. Uh, we offered that course, I think, eight years in a row, both as a summer institute offering and as a full term course at the school. And she was constantly the fan favorite. Um, students loved her uh, because of her genuine care for them and her genuine care for people with autism and wanting everyone to understand the experiences of people with autism and how research can help. Um, we will sorely miss her at the Wendy Clegg Center and at the Bloomberg School and in the Department of Epidemiology and also in the Department of Mental Health uh, that I chair and that she was jointly appointed into. Um, I think you won't find a more genuine autism researcher who really cared about the people she worked for and also the people that she worked with. And we love you, Li Ching. Um, you will forever make an imprint on the work we do, the way we do it, and how much we care for each other. So in your memory and honor, thank you so much. Li Ching was incredibly tenacious and diligent. She loved her work, she loved her students, and she was incredibly dedicated to autism research. Hi, I'm Liz Stewart, Vice Dean for Education at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and a professor in the Department of Mental Health. I had the honor of working with Li Ching through the Wendy Clagg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities. In thinking about this tribute, the immediate thing that came to mind was a word that described Li Ching to me, and that's enthusiasm. Every interaction I had with her, she just had a spirit of enthusiasm for everything that she was doing, whether it was a research project, student work, something in one of our personal lives, something related to the Wendy Clagg Center. She just brought a joy and enthusiasm that was infectious. I hope that we can all carry on that spirit of enthusiasm in her honor as we remember her today and moving forward. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Lee. Li Ching Li Professor is my mother's aunt. And here's something I want to share about. We've had a great time in the U.S. because of you. You kindly let us stay at your house, and we went to lots of places. You made us feel better. When we need you, you're always there for us. We would like to say thank you for always being there. Thank you for being our hero. Hello, my name is Yu Chong. My little auntie Li Qin, she had the most brilliant and the most beautiful mind and the kindest heart. I am from Taiwan and I have never seen snow my whole life. The first winter in the US, my little auntie bought me the most soft, the most fluffy and the most and the warmest comforter to sleep. My little auntie loved organizing gatherings. She liked talking 
and laughing. Most of all, she liked sharing. She loved buying things for her family and friends. On the contrary, she rarely bought anything for herself. She invited the whole family to travel to the U.S. and almost paid for everything. She's the true angel from the heaven. Also, she is the true heroine of her life. She fought and fought and fought, and finally rests in peace. I don't want her to leave. I have to say goodbye to her. I will remember and treasure all of my memories with my little auntie. I learned so much from her, and will fight to live in the U.S. just like what she did for her for the past thirty years. I love you, my little auntie. Now I am saying goodbye to you. We are so proud of being in this family. So we'll start our first session. Our speaker will be Dr. Craig Newshafer. Please join me in welcoming him. He's the Dean and Professor of Biobehavioral Health at Penn State University. Prior to becoming Dean, he was the Director of the AJ Drexel Autism Institute and Pref Professor and Chairman of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics there. And he first met Li Ching here at Johns Hopkins, where he was an Associate Professor and Director of G the General Epi Methods Track was the original Maryland PI for the Adam and Seed Studies, and actually was the one that hired Li Ching um, to come to Hopkins as faculty. He's published over uh, 100 peer-reviewed articles and is a recognized leader in the field of autism spectrum disorder, epidemiology, and public health. Okay. Should we hold that? Yeah, I think I'm okay. okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to the organizers of today's symposium. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, great to see many of you in person. A lot of familiar names over there on the Zoom board, uh, uh, names from uh, the past uh, and, and still the present too as, as well. Um, uh, I'm, re I'm really delighted to be here and uh, pleased to give this uh, first talk to, uh, uh, to, to, to start the day. So, as has been mentioned, uh, Li, Li Ching uh, Li returned to Johns Hopkins as a faculty member uh, in, in uh, 2003. Uh, for those who didn't know, she completed her master's, as has been mentioned, in the Department of Then Mental Hygiene in 1987 before she decamped for a few years in, in Chapel Hill. Uh, she loved her UNC experience, uh, but I know that when she came back, she felt like she was really returning home. And um, let's see. There we go. And uh, she was returning home at an interesting time. It was really the dawn of a new era in autism epidemiology. At the turn of the millennium, there was an explosion of interest in and an explosion of scholarship on the epidemiology of autism. Uh, the figure here uh, just displays uh, a plot of the frequency of PubMed citations that come up on a simple search of the words autism and epidemiology. And the year that Leeching arrived, there were 100 papers, as you can see. Uh, and, and last year, there were 10 times that. And the slope has been uh, um, uh, uh, impressively positive. Many here remember, but, but for those who do not, let me take uh, a few minutes to briefly describe what the climate was like around epidemiologic questions about autism in 2003. So there was tremendous attention and great concern about autism's apparently rising prevalence at that time. It was regular news, in Times Magazine, and uh, the PBS NewsHour, the Evening News, and the New York Times. Uh, as, you, as you see here, uh, the, the, the figure to the left is a, is a chart that appeared in the, in the Times around that, around that uh, point in history. Uh, but what was shown there is a simple graphic presenting uh, numerator-only data from a single administrative service system in the state of California. 
Now, this is a far cry from the properly denominated, nationally representative, near real time updates we see in epidemiologic dashboards now published by mainstream media. The other dominant dynamic happening at that time uh, were, were the theories around the causal link between uh, vaccines and autism. These had been introduced and were being aggressively promoted. In the center, you see a print ad uh, purchased by the anti-vaccine advocacy organization Generation Rescue. And at right is the cover of a book that reached the New York Times bestseller list in, in, in 2005, uh, focused on that now uh, a debunked theory. But efforts were uh, forming up uh, in, in the nation's public health uh, system to respond to the situation where there was a lack of quality data, including the most basic descriptive epidemiology information around autism. Uh, this lack of data created a vacuum into which uh, dangerous theories could uh, propagate. The Federal uh, Children's Health Act uh, generated funds for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to develop a network of sites around the country to engage in high quality autism epidemiology. The, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health submitted an application for the initial uh, Autism Surveillance System Development Award in 2000 and followed that up with an application for the Centers for Autism and Developmental Disabilities uh, 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 Research and Epidemiology Centers that ultimately supported both the surveillance work and also established uh, the SEED case control study that continues today. The assistant scientist position that Li Cheng assumed in 2003 was created because of the CDC awards. And as most assembled here and, and, and on Zoom know, in the ensuing two decades of her career, she remained associated with the CDC projects, ultimately taking over as PI of the Adam Surveillance Site here at Hopkins, and also staying on as an active investigator in Maryland SEED. Li Ching was also uh, a willing methods-oriented collaborator to clinician researchers, and she contributed to a series of treatment studies. I see Andy Zimmerman is, is, is up on the board. She collaborated with Andy Zimmerman and Susan Connors and others, and was also always interested in capitalizing on national uh, public use data sets when there was insight to be gained about, about autism through those. She cared about work that benefited children, carrying forward a theme from her days uh, uh, as a graduate student, which maybe we'll hear, hear more about in some of the subsequent panels. Uh, as, as most of you also know and has been mentioned, Li Ching also eventually successfully integrated work on the global epidemiology of autism, a real passion of hers, into her research portfolio. And, and Kathy will, will, will speak to that work in the next, in the next talk. But for the rest of my time, um, I'm going to return to uh, the theme of descriptive epidemiology of autism spectrum disorders in the United States. That was the work that brought Li Ching here to Hopkins and work that she stayed engaged in over the remainder of her career. So uh, this simple graphic uh, highlights the ASD summary prevalence pattern over time that has emerged from the ADAM network. Certainly, this is the single element of descriptive epidemiology uh, of, of autism that the a a ADAM network has contributed to and by far receives the most attention. Uh, these data are a bit of a blessing and a bit of a curse. And I'll return briefly to this time side of the person, place, time descriptive epidemiology triangle at the end of the talk, but I want to shift focus now to the person side, an area where Adam has added tremendously through the detailed data it regularly assembles on sizable and representative uh, series of autism cases. In particular, I'm going to focus on the descriptive work uh, on conditions that, that co-occur with autism spectrum disorders. This is an interesting area where Li Cheng tended to be a frequent and important contributor to efforts coming out of the ADAM network and also, also the SEED studies as well. So a uh, little, little hard to read, but this is a table from one of the very first ADAM descriptive papers on co-occurring conditions. Uh, this is based on the very first ADAM surveillance year 2002. Uh, for those who don't know, and most people here I think do, but just briefly, ADAM cases are ascertained at multiple geographically defined sites around the country by compiling, reviewing, and abstracting existing health and existing education uh, system records for eight-year-old children who reside in those catchment areas. Um, and, and they're flagged because they have a range of triggers for neurodevelopmental diagnoses and other risk markers. Prior to the 2018 surveillance year, cases could be ascertained and confirmed even without a documented autism diagnosis in their service system records. 
Uh, this was an intentional feature designed into the system because at the time there were real concerns uh, when Adam was launched that autism was being underdiagnosed in the in the community. So if, if, if we look at the top row of this of this table, simply what you're seeing is you're seeing four classes of co-occurring conditions and you're seeing the proportion of autism cases in Adam in that year uh, that that had one or more of the diagnoses in each category. So about 83% of the autism cases had other developmental diagnoses, 10% psychiatric diagnoses, 16% uh, neurologic diagnoses, and about 4% who had diagnoses that at the time were thought to be causally linked to, uh, to, to autism. So the high prevalence of other developmental diagnoses uh, was not really a surprise. But what the team did is they went on to explore, and, and I'm not going to show you the uh, busier results slide for this, I'll just talk through them. They, they went on to explore whether or not the documentation of uh, comorbidity among cases was associated with that ASD diagnosis actually appearing in the health system records. So negative associations were found. Uh, ASD diagnoses were less common in the records when there were co-occurring conditions also in the records. The magnitudes varied a little bit across these, across these categories, but this suggested that the, there were, it was either masking of diagnosis by condition co-occurrence or mislabeling, uh, perhaps associated with a hesitancy to label a child with an, with an autism diagnosis. Also, among those uh, who did have an autism diagnosis in their records, co-occurring conditions were associated with a later age of acquiring that uh, diagnosis. A few years uh, uh, later, Li Ching and colleagues, including Eric, who we'll uh, hear from later, uh, looked at the time trend in these co-occurring co uh, conditions using the same categories in the original uh, paper that focused just on, on 2002 data. The y-axis here shows the average count of co-occurring conditions, and the trend uh, shows that there was an increasing uh, number over the subsequent six years, though the increase was not uh, wildly dramatic. But as this was happening, remember that a uh, ASD prevalence overall was rising, and the average age of community-acquired diagnosis was also declining. Kids were getting diagnosed earlier. So this trend doesn't really support the idea that there was an increase in diagnostic hesitancy or masking over time, but rather probably was reflective of increased recognition of the clinical importance of co-occurring co conditions in autism spectrum disorders. So to dig a little deeper into the impact uh, uh, that these high quality descriptive data on co-occurring diagnosis has had, let's return to that original table I shared with the 2002 data and note the proportion of cases with co-occurring uh, um, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Previously in the literature, there was, uh, you know, there were a number of studies from smaller clinical samples that suggested that there was a substantive proportion of ADHD co-occurrence in autism, but there was concern with those studies that there were selection effects in these, in these clinically ascertained samples. But here in the Adam community sample, there was increased confidence that the high prevalence of co-occurring ADHD might be real. Uh, it's also notable that at this time, uh, the DSM-4 was the diagnostic standards in place, and clinicians under DSM-4 were actually prohibited from simultaneously assigning a child with a diagnosis of autism and ADHD. Um, uh, so the co-occurrence that we see here had to come from either different clinicians making those two diagnoses or the same clinician making the diagnosis at two different points in time. This high co-occurrence of, of, of uh, ADHD with autism has uh, since been replicated in other large community-based samples. There was recently a, a meta-analysis of this in Lancet Psychiatry, and the, the pooled uh, ADHD co-occurrence prevalence reported there was 22%, which is actually very close to the, uh, to the initial number from, from, from Adam. And, and this accumulation of data was, was really instrumental in, in the rethinking of the restriction and the diagnostic criteria. And in DSM-5, it was removed. And the two conditions can now be, uh, can now be diagnosed together in, 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 in children. And since then, scientific and clinical interest in the relationship between autism and ADHD has actually grown uh, substantially. Subsequent work has established that autism with co-occurring ADHD is associated with poor outcomes, as uh, documented in the recent meta-analysis. I've clipped a, 
a figure from that I won't walk through over, over on the left. Um, another meta-analysis that appeared just last month synthesized findings on excess mortality among individuals with ASD and individuals with ADHD. It, it, it didn't specifically look at the co-occurrence of those uh, conditions or explore potential synergy of, of uh, mortality risk effects. But the juxtaposition in the same paper has already generated an editorial uh, raising concern that the co-occurrence likely poses even more mortality risks on individuals with both diagnoses. Given the prevalence of uh, ASD, ADHD co-occurrence and its documented association with poorer outcomes, one of the five NIH uh, ACE Center grants that was awarded this last round in 2017 was focused on the autism ADHD uh, co-occurrence co and, and uh, risk relationship. That center has launched a series of related projects to improve assessment and intervention approaches for the specific subgroup and results are soon going to be appearing in the literature. Progress has been a little bit slower with respect to research designed to gain an understanding of the etiology uh, driving the co-occurrence uh, of, of autism and ADHD. It's possible that one condition might cause the other, although that seems, seems improbable. It's also uh, possible that the conditions could be correlated purely due to diagnostic confusion. But there's also been um, um, speculation around biotropy, shared common genetic risk factors. And, and, and the, the, the results shown at the left are a, a paper in science from the Brainstorm Consortium that was not extremely supportive of the, the, uh, the notion of shared common genetic causes. There was little genomic correlation found in, in that analysis, but a psychiatric genetics consortium paper that soon followed in Cell the next year found a statistically significant correlation. So this is still a very, a very active area of, of investigation. The scoping review I, uh, I highlight on the right we just came out late last year, and um, it was looking at the published latent class analyses of the phenotypic characteristics of autism and ASD. And the conclusion there was that this body of literature supported the idea that there was a distinct latent class among those with autism and ADHD and uh, suggests that perhaps there might be a driving distinct causal mechanism for that group. So I, I would hazard to say that uh, leveraging uh, neuropsychiatric condition co-occurrence in order to understand etiologic mechanisms is one of the more active areas in uh, psychiatric epidemiology uh, today. So turning back to uh, some other work on condition co-occurrence in Adam, uh, this is a 2018 paper that Li Ching was senior author on, and it looked at the relationship between sex and co-occurring conditions among ASD cases. And it found a fairly consistent association between female sex and increased odds of the presence of at least one co-occurring condition diagnosis. Now, in, in Adam, the overall male to female prevalence ratio has remained pretty constant at around four to one. Uh, even as the overall prevalence of autism estimated through Adam has, has increased. The average age of community diagnosis um, uh, uh, among uh, cases is, um, is uh, not later for girls, and girls in Adam actually had an earlier age of first evaluation than, than did boys on average, at least in the last year that those data were reported, which was 2016. However, girls who are diagnosed after age eight would be missed entirely uh, by Adam. And I know that Adam is now working on follow-up of 16-year-olds, the earliest cohorts, and, and that's gonna probably be a question that's, uh, that's gonna be intensively investigated in, 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 in those efforts. So the, the, the disproportionate amount of diagnostic comorbidity in girls with autism has received a fair amount of attention in the subfield focused on the underpinnings of the apparent sexual dimorphism of, of autism spectrum disorders. A recent review of potential barriers to autism diagnosis in girls that came out of Frankie Happy's group at King's College in, in the UK uh, focused a lot of the discussion on possible gendered conceptions of, of symptomology, uh, possible sex differences and deployment of 
of compensatory or camouflaging mechanisms, but also noted the differential reporting of co-occurring diagnoses in, 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 in girls, or the differential occurrence of co-occurring conditions in, in girls. They refer to the ADAM results in that paper and point up other studies that noted this positive association between female sex and increased number of co-occurring conditions. So examination of the role of co-occurring conditions in the diagnostic odyssey for girls, I think is, is, is something that we're going to see continuing as work in this particular subfield uh, expands in the future. So uh, a number of other groups are actively investigating the potential biologic underpinnings of the autism sex differential. So, here are some findings from uh, uh, the GENDAR consortium, which was also a 2017 ACE funded effort. Here an, an autism a polygenic risk score was constructed and correlated with fMRI measures of connectivity along an established salience network uh, among brain regions that are important for establishing orientation to social stimuli in, in infants. Associations were found between the, the genetic uh, risk score and connectivity in boys, but not in girls with autism. So one wonders if differential neuropsychiatric comorbidity could be a confounder here, since uh, the only exclusions made were, were for those who had uh, frank uh, um, pathology above the brainstem. So I think it's highly likely that uh, um, condition co-occurrence will be increasingly factored into this kind of work not only for adjustment purposes, but uh, perhaps also to help hone in on some of the heterogeneous etiologic mechanisms that may be operating. So um, Adam's documentation of conditions co-occurring with autism spectrum disorders in large community samples uh, has undergirded subsequent work establishing these conditions as key determinants of quality of life among children with autism has helped reveal actionable clues on diagnostic delay and is being factored into ongoing work uh, intended to discover uh, further clues on the elusive etiology of autism. All right, so as I, as I prepare to uh, close, uh, let me turn back to, for a moment to uh, prevalence time trends and the curse and the blessings of what we've seen with, with, with Adam. So no one loves to see an Adam surveillance summary release followed by a very unnuanced uh, headline like uh, this one from uh, WebMD last December. And, and over the years, uh, Adam methods and the interpretation of the drivers of the secular trend witnessed in Adam data have spurred, I think, you know, more, more fully reasoned and, and hopefully healthy debate, uh, as well as have prompted additional research on, on surveillance uh, methodology for autism. But Regardless of any remaining questions on prevalent secular trends, it's indisputable that through the dedication and hard work of the Adam team, including all the investigators, leeching amongst them, uh, um, Adam clearly established that autism is not a rarity and is still being recognized more frequently today in US children. In the data vacuum that existed at the turn of the millennium when leaching started here at, at Hopkins, there was ample room to question that. And in part, because of the general consensus that Adam helped establish around this, we've seen increased investment in autism research over the 15 years since the first Adam surveillance summary was published. Here are some data from the, uh, uh, the uh, Interagency Autism Coordinating Council that show the combined public and private research funding for autism nearly doubling over 10 years uh, from where it was in 2008. But um, I think we still have a ways to go. Uh, this figure shows an eight-year trend just in NIH funding uh, for autism uh, research and for Alzheimer's uh, disease research. And, and, and it shows that for every dollar NIH puts, puts towards autism research, $10 goes to Alzheimer's disease research. Uh, but it does show optimistically that steeper investment in a research priority can be achieved. And it's my hope, and I think it would have been Li Qing's hope, that things might move in this direction for autism research in the future. So uh, I'm going to end with this photo, which I think dates back to around 2004 or thereabouts, uh, and, and makes a nice transition to, uh, to Kathy's talk. Uh, on the left is Dr. Yanquin Guo 
who went on to collaborate with Li Ching and Kathy on the development of the Mandarin version of the uh, ASSQ screening questionnaire. Uh, next to him is his mentor, uh, Dr. Yang, who is one of the uh, luminaries in child psychiatry in, 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 in China. They were uh, visiting us here at Hopkins and we also took them up to the Delaware Autism Program as part of a Fogarty grant that Li Ching and I had that was uh, intended to try to figure out how to do modern epidemiology of autism in China. I never figured that out, but Li Ching did. And uh, I'm proud to have helped a little bit to catalyze her work in this area where she went on to make tremendous contributions and uh, was destined to do so much more if she hadn't been lost to us so soon. Uh, my, my really, my only regret in showing, in showing this particular picture is that Li Ching is not smiling. And if you knew Li Ching, you knew that she smiled readily and frequently. And although her life, like all of ours, was not always easy, she always brought uh, uh, with her a lightness of being that will be sorely missed, as will uh, all her unrealized contributions to our field. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll take a short break now, um, especially for those on Zoom um, to have a little bit of free screen time. We will come back at, um, let's see, we'll have a break until 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. We'll we will show another um, short video from many of Li Ching's collaborators and colleagues, um, and that'll begin our session two, uh, and we'll have Dr. Kathy Rice give a talk on global autism research. So we'll see you again at three o'clock.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll start set, uh, session two now, which will focus more on global autism research. And we're actually gonna start with another short video, um, this time of tributes from many of Lee Chang's um, colleagues and collaborators on autism research. My name is Lisa Wiggins. I'm a behavioral scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as CDC. I had the honor of working with Dr. Li Chi Ling for the past 20 years on autism surveillance and research projects funded by CDC. Li Ching was a brilliant scientist, but more importantly, she was a kind, compassionate, and considerate individual. She truly valued multidisciplinary collaboration and integrated thoughts and ideas from different fields into her work, which inspired her colleagues and strengthened her overall impact. Li Ching also brought a broad socio-cultural perspective to all of her projects. She encouraged her colleagues to think about how culture shapes development and how we can use data to support individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities and their families throughout the lifespan. Li Ching's contributions to the fields of mental health, child development, and epidemiology are far from realized. She will continue to inspire our work and the work of many others for years to come. Li Ching is truly missed. Hi everyone, my name is Audrey Thurm and I want to pay special tribute to Li Ching who I met in 2003 when she first joined Johns Hopkins, when Craig Neuschafer introduced us and she helped me with the statistics for my, uh, for my master's thesis, which I was publishing. And it was one of the first projects she worked on um, in autism uh, with her new job. And she was the most enthusiastic, detail-oriented, friendly and cheerful person to be around. We became friends instantly, talked about many other things. She cared so much about her work, the people around her, helping the field and expanding the work globally that you'll, I'm sure, hear more about. She brought the perspective that we needed to make our work helpful to the field immediately and make sure that we not just help those in, the, in this country, but beyond. I miss Li Ching very much. I am a researcher at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I would like to pay tribute to the memory of Li Ching Li. I met Li Ching when I was part of the research network for ADAM, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, and SEED, study to explore early development. I have very fond memories of Li Ching. She was a great collaborator. Collaborator. Regardless of how busy she was, she was always willing and able to pitch in and support our efforts to improve our insights into the characterization of autism to enable improvement in care. She is greatly missed. I'm Rebecca Landa from Kennedy Krieger Institute, and Li Ching Li was a close and treasured colleague of mine. There were so many things about Li Ching that set her apart from everyone else, and one was her pure generosity and humility. She uh, wanted to make life better for all human beings around the globe. She went out of her way to honor people, to bring people together. One of the things that I think set her apart professionally was her knowledge of temperament, her real understanding of statistic and epidemiology, and she brought all these pieces of knowledge together to really uh, shed new light on the way we think about autism and the way we understand how to uh, approach uh, autism and making the world a better place for autistic people through a public health uh, approach. I am Andy Zimmerman, a pediatric neurologist, now retired from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Words cannot express the deep loss that my wife Susan and I have felt since the death of Lee Cheng Lee last year. 
She was a very dear friend and colleague for 17 years. Part of our wedding party in 2010 and rescued our recent clinical trial when our statistical team failed us. She was tenacious to the end, right up until the study was published a few days following her untimely death. I first got to know Li Ching through our study of HLA types in families with autism spectrum disorder about 2004 at Hopkins and Kennedy Krieger Institute. Her quick insight into the data that my colleagues and I had collected was so impressive. When we first met in less than an hour, she outlined the analytic approaches we would use with her keen insight and knowledge of autism with what I soon learned was her typical good humor and great intellect. The study had languished for want of her expertise and energy, and she was reluctant to be first author on the paper, which she clearly deserved. In many studies and papers to follow, Li Ching always gave her utmost to produce the most complete analyses and coherent discussions possible. She could turn any ordinary study into a masterpiece. My name is Parul Christian, and I'm a professor in the Department of International Health and the director of the Human Nutrition Program. I was introduced to a new Li Ching since 2011, when we first met to discuss and collaborate on a prevalence and risk factor study of uh, autism in our population study site located in rural Bangladesh. She was a recognized world expert on autism for low and middle income countries. And when I met her, she immediately struck me as a kind, attentive, gracious, and an unassuming individual. At Hopkins, our nutrition group has been doing micronutrient and maternal and child health research in the Northwestern region of Bangladesh in collaboration with colleagues in Bangladesh. And our research project site called Javida was established in 2000. So in 2011, we had um, this opportunity and funding to follow a cohort, a birth cohort of children whose mothers had participated in a research trial of vitamin A supplementation. Li Ching joined our team to lead this effort as an expert in autism bringing um, really scientific rigor and assessment of ASD using tests that had not previously been used in Bangladesh. It was a long and challenging study requiring rigorous training in ASD testing. And throughout its conduct, her knowledge, her patience, insights and cultural acumen for working in a rural South Asian context were really very commendable. Of course, without her expertise and networks, we could not have done this exciting study of screening uh, over 8,000 children in, the, in, the, in this rural population and testing them to estimate the population level burden of autism and its risk factors in this environment. Hi, I'm Marie Diener West, the chair of the Master of Public Health program at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I have had the great privilege and pleasure of interacting with Li Ching through our MPH students. Over the past 15 years, Li Ching has served as a committed academic advisor for 15 students and a capstone advisor for 12 students whose interests were in epidemiology and autism. More so, Li Ching taught a required epidemiology course that was taken by hundreds of our online MPH students. I will never forget the kindness and compassion that she showed all students and her sincere desire for all students to succeed. She is missed. Hello, my name is Keith West. I'm the George Grant Professor of Infant and Child Nutrition in the Department of International Health. I knew Li Ching over the course of the past decade, working together with a team here at Hopkins and in Bangladesh to carry out the first 
a population-based survey of uh, autism in eight to 10-year-old children in rural Bangladesh. Li Cheng was an, an amazing collaborator. She was our technical expert. She knew all of the steps for certifying the protocols uh, and for getting all the permissions and for training the staff that needed to carry out the work. She was just a wonderful person to work with. She was kind, gentle, always interested, attentive, and um, somebody that we'll, we will miss dearly. Her, her contributions will go on for years and years in South Asia as autism is uh, increasingly investigated in the future. Our next speaker will be Dr. Kathy Rice, who is currently the branch chief of Disability and Health Promotion uh, Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prior to her current position at the CDC, was, she was previously at Emory University, where she was professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and the director of the Emory Autism Center. She's a world-renowned developmental psychologist and autism researcher and a longtime friend and colleague of Lee Ching Lee. So please welcome her. Hi, it's an honor to be here and to speak some about Li Ching and our adventures together. It could also be called our time on the road was always in search of another meal. Uh, <laughs> Li, Ching, Li Ching well knew that she uh, loved her food and delighted in every meal um, and fortunately I was able to have uh, many wonderful uh, times at a table with her. So I just want to talk a little bit about global autism research and some of the perspectives um, that I personally gained um, in the United States and bringing that information uh, and experience to mainland, mainland China and Taiwan. But honestly everything I know about global autism research I learned from and with Li Ching. Uh, again, we had many, uh, many different trips together, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. But first, I want to just take a, a step to think about a little bit the history of autism, which has really been written in a way about Western cultures, really focused on the early identification of autism. Uh, in the 1940s here at Johns Hopkins, um, and also what was uh, thought to be a, a a turn of synchronicity where uh, Hans Asperger was also uh, working on similar writings when really now we know that they were much more connected and had a similar, they had staff in common. And so it was not as uh, much of a parallel, but really a, a global sharing of experience and knowledge at the time. But over the course of autism, since uh, the condition has been identified, we've seen a big change in the way we look at autism moving from uh, what was considered the classic period of autism for many years from the 1940s to 70s. We really looked at autism in more of this prototype of the child, the white male child who maybe had language, but it tended to be echoic and repetitive, uh, may have intellectual disability most likely, and was relatively rare, about one in 2,000 children. And in particular in the 80s um, and at the period that Craig Neuschafer spoke about, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, we really had this emergence of understanding uh, the range of autism. We, we are still understanding the way that autism presents, uh, where it's considered a disorder and where it's characteristics, but we definitely think of autism now as a spectrum being much more common. Uh, with, with recent estimates, when we look at global prevalence, about one in a thousand, with also a big shift in terms of the intellectual functioning of people who are identified today. So this emergence of the spectrum in the last 20, 30 years, but 20 years in particular, 
really has been brought about by this cycle of really starting with autism advocacy driven by parents, uh, particularly parents looking for a cure for autism. Well, that's more controversial today. And we think more about autism acceptance and how to improve quality of life. The drive of the parents to help us understand what's going on, why does their children present the way they do, uh, really drove research. And their passion was really important in terms of us getting the data that we needed to identify um, autism in the, in the population in the US and in, the, in Europe as well. And over that time, it has driven a, 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 a major source of research uh, we've looked at the complexity and the diversity of autism. We've expanded to not just think about children, but the lifespan, um, looking at females and cultural diversity, variation in communication abilities and intellectual abilities, um, looking at co-occurring conditions, um, looking at the fact that there's not a single cause for autism and that there are challenges, but there are also strengths associated with autism. And through this advocacy and research, We've also had changes in our policies and laws that support more services and, and uh, supports, as well as tools and resources. And that's an important story when we think about global research in autism, because the initial efforts to bring together what was happening mainly in the United States and in Western Europe uh, really came together in what was known as the International Meeting for Autism Research, IMFAR, started in 2001. The first IMFAR in San Diego was relatively small, I think about 300 researchers, some, some of whom may be in this room. Um, and now that has, has really broadened to be the International Society for Autism Research, striving to actually uh, realize the, the vision of being an international society. For a long time, it was pretty much the IMFAR meeting was in the US or maybe pop over to the UK. Um, and now we have a range of efforts. We have international networks on epidemiology that, that started and that, um, that grew into various other initiatives. Uh, we've got a range of support groups and uh, special interest groups and early career supports and global leaders who can be identified around the globe who all come together to network and share research through this, this uh, resource. We've seen a, a big focus on global awareness of autism in terms of the United Nations Convention of, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2006, really bringing more of a focus to people with disabilities across the globe. And through the advocacy of groups like Aut Autism Speaks, really emphasizing global autism public health initiative which focus not only on epidemiology, but also on the supports and services and how do we bring the tools that we can use to support the children who are around the world um, to those different countries. We've had initiatives through the World Health Organization. And now, as uh, we just experienced, World Autism Day. But when you look at the actual profile of global autism research, uh, we see it's very, uh, it's not very global in many ways. While uh, an analysis that looked at research through 2014 uh, identified over 18,000 research articles between the years 2005 and 2014, and they were in 33 different languages, but almost 93% of those articles were in English. Um, and the majority, oh, my little, got really tiny, uh, over 50% of those articles were from uh, the United States and Canada, with about 35% from Western Europe, leaving about 12 to 13% represented from places around the rest of the world. So if we have, if we look at the distribution of the world right now, and most of our, our research is really coming from high income countries, um, but that's really where only 10% of the world's children live. And so right now, the current estimate, if we look at um, a, a prevalence of one to 2%, we estimate about 78 million people with autism spectrum disorder worldwide. And 95% of those individuals live in low and middle income countries, as opposed to the majority of our research representing high income countries. 
So how does the research based mostly on high income white Western children represent the geographic, socioeconomic and cultural diversity of the autism spectrum around the world? In an effort, as we've heard of many of Li Ching's efforts, um, she was very passionate and focused on bringing the knowledge that she had and expanding it, particularly to low and middle income countries. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with her in 2017, uh, co-editing a special issue of autism on global research. And we really were focusing on some of the key questions about if we're going to look at the geographic, socioeconomic and cultural variations in autism, first, we really have to do a better job of systematically analyzing what standards are we identifying autism on? Among who? How are we doing it? With what consequences? And that was particularly important. Um, and in the special issue, we wanted to focus not only on the identification and the instrument adaptation and use, but also intervention development. So setting the stage before we can get into really looking at uh, more causal research, looking at phenotype, looking at psychological processes, looking at the course over time, we really need to be able to identify uh, who we're talking about, what we're talking about on the spectrum. And so I wanna share just some of my experiences in learning in China and Taiwan um, for, through multiple trips over the years. Uh, five of these were with Li Qing. Um, and in many ways, I call her my autism clinician brain, like I can't function without her because she and I did so many evaluations together. Um, and we had a little language where I could lean in and she would she would be translating and tell me a little more or she would, we had little symbols for your, you know, gestures that what we just knew what we were talking about while we were doing assessments together. I will miss that greatly and I learned a great deal from that experience with her. Um, but my experience started really in 2007 um, at CDC when we were trying to do a follow-up study of a folic acid cohort where over 250,000 women were uh, followed pre-conception through birth and then their children followed up later. And that really formed the basis for evidence for folic acid, folic acid fortification and the reduction of neural tube defects. In that effort, we were trying to determine, could we identify whether autism was more common because there was a, a hypothesis at the time that folic acid um, and autism may be associated. And the, the hypothesis went both ways, um, both a positive um, and a negative association. And so um, my job as a, as a clinician and as a, a public health researcher was to really just go and immerse and try to understand the context. Um, and to determine what could we use for screening tools, what was being used now by clinicians, what were the standards, and how could the, we do a more formal diagnostic assessment uh, that would be of research quality. At the same time, Lee Chang was working with Craig Neuschaefer on their uh, efforts to start a, a prevalence study in China. And these efforts converged um, and diverged in some ways where uh, Li Cheng and I continued to work together on the folic acid study, really trying to identify uh, screening tools and diagnostic assessments. And through that, we were working on doing training with the autism diagnostic observation schedule and the autism diagnostic interview uh, with our colleagues at Peking University. Um, through the, the years and some of the challenge of global autism research is sustaining the funding um, and sustaining the focus, particularly one of the things that we have definitely learned in terms of our experience in China is that it's a great risk and a great re reward that things can happen very fast when they actually do happen. Um, they can stop very suddenly um, and they can happen at a very large scale that's incredible and not possible to do here. And it's only through Li Ching's tenacity that we were able to persevere through various grants, through various efforts to really develop the screening um, techniques and the training with a particular clinician team that led us to her recent R01 uh, with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, looking at air quality in Beijing. Uh, this is uh, of anything she worked for years and years uh, to achieve this, this milestone um, and all of us that worked on it together uh, were heartbroken to think about it 
not continuing uh, without her leadership. None of us could imagine how it could continue without her leadership. And I'm very grateful, um, particularly uh, to Chris Latacosta for taking over as, as uh, PI and Jim Zhang and for Pen Chao Tai continuing on just tenaciously himself, quietly behind the scenes to make this, this project work. So throughout this process, uh, China has also been going through a sea change in terms of very similar to what we experienced um, you know, in the 90s and the early 2000s in the US, uh, where autism was pretty much a hidden condition um, sorry for the strange formatting, uh, for many years, and also a source of, of challenge for many families, particularly with the one child policy. If you have one child and there may be uh, challenges with that child that may not be evident at birth, there are real consequences, both stigma-wise as well as financial for many families. And that creates a very complicated context that brings up a lot of ethical issues in terms of when we are trying to identify these children, um, in a place where that may not be uh, the best thing in the interest of the family. Also, uh, and thankfully, we've seen huge changes in that direction. Um, we've seen changes in terms of education, at least in name, including um, children with disabilities in regular education. Um, although there are not, it's not required to attend school in that way, and there are special schools, um, there at least over time have been increasing, very similar to what's happened in Western societies, increasing protections and laws, uh, and also specifically naming children with autism. We've also seen parent advocacy. Um, in 1993, the Stars and Rain uh, organization was started by a parent who decided that she needed to do more for her child on the spectrum. And she started a parent training and then later a school and has really been an important source of advocacy for autism in China. We've also have the, the China Disabled Persons Federation. And over time, this has been also very uh, important in the ability to raise awareness for autism and also have an incentive because uh, over time, families would be able to uh, apply to have another child if one of their children were disabled they also would have been able to obtain more support and financial support. And it's really uh, been important in terms of contributing to more of a greater awareness of autism. So we do know for sure that who you identify with autism depends on how you identify. And there's a wide range of prevalence estimates. People have been, been working on identifying prevalence of autism. And we know that if you take a more passive approach and you look at those individuals who are identified, they tend to be individuals who need higher supports, who may also have intellectual disability and maybe other co-occurring conditions, and we have a much lower prevalence. Instead, if we do more active case finding, which is typically a two-stage screening where we're doing more active going out and screening a, a larger population of children, uh, making sure that both screen positive as well as a sample of screen negatives are evaluated and ascertained, that we have a much higher prevalence, more in line with what is being identified in some other areas of the world. But some of the key issues that uh, I've learned in this experience was really the importance of, of understanding cultural context as somebody from the United States coming in um, to uh, uh, the Chinese system was, was different and unusual for, for me and was really important to spend a lot of time listening in terms of looking at the health system of having village, town, and county levels, um, and then thinking about if a child was identified as someone who maybe wasn't talking or somebody that was behaving in an unusual manner, where would they go? What would this look like? Um, what were some of the cultural beliefs and values an important aspect of identification of autism in the Chinese context is the value of academic achievement over social skills, um, particularly in Taiwan. Um, talking late being a sign of intelligence, um, obedience to adults as important. And so when we're talking about doing a play-based assessment, that might not be very comfortable for both the child and the adults and how do we adapt. 
also what was really key was to get to know the group of clinicians who are the experts um, in the country and to understand their perspective. And the most important thing is that we really didn't see autism terribly differently. Um, and the importance of the trainings that we did was really to have a shared vocabulary, to have a shared way of examining um, the behaviors that we were seeing, but then to document it in a more formal way that would be uh, up to standard for research publications. So it's important also thinking about the, the ways of operating um, ethical and research standards that may be different. Um, what is permission, what is assent, and what is consent may be different. Uh, there are different, again, when we talk about high risk, high rewards, uh, depending on who is backing your study, you may have a very high response rate that we would never see in a Western um, setting, but you also may not be able to do the study at all. So uh, and you have to think about the ethical implications. Also looking at, um, you know, what are the tools that were being used? So when I first went to China in 2007, uh, clinically, they were still using a scale called the Clancy Behavioral Scale, which was one that was never really used here. Um, but the, the behaviors that were being observed were not un, unusual to the clinicians. We had a shared vocabulary. Um, and a big part of the translation of the research tools was again in going through that process together and looking at, well, what are the criteria we're using now, whether it's the DSM-4 or the DSM-5, how are we examining them, how do you conceive of this uh, type of behavior, and how are we going to make sure when we look at these tools that they are translated and back translated in a way that actually gets to the meaning that's intended. So I think an important thing, we could talk a lot about the various diagnostic tools, and it's a concern that when we look at the gold standard of diagnostic assessment, we focus primarily on two tools, the ADOS and the ADI. And unfortunately, it's a challenge because they're very time consuming and they're expensive. Uh, but there's also a value in investing in a small group of individuals who really go through that process to work with other researchers who have gone through that process or research clinicians to have a shared vocabulary about social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, relationships. You know, early on when we started, there were questions about, well, will the behaviors we're observing in the ADOS represent autism um, in Beijing, in rural China? What does that look like? And the reality is that the behaviors that are the constellation of autism are very similar. It's really the clinician's understanding of what is the cultural context. Everybody makes eye contact in different ways. It's not that eye contact does or doesn't exist. Um, so you have to have the understanding of that culture. You have to understand when it's appropriate and you have to know, is that person initiating and responding in a way that's socially um, appropriate and communicative? Another key component of global autism research particularly is thinking of the family's experience. What are the implications of identifying uh, somebody on the autism spectrum, particularly if there's not the infrastructure uh, for either school or for other support services? And I, I love this quote by Li Ching about parents' love for their children is not different because of where they live or how many resources they have. So parents are trying to figure out the best thing for their children. I had an experience in Beijing where, um, without warning, was, I, I'll say asked, but this was a voluntold um, opportunity to evaluate a three-year-old child. And the three-year-old child happened to be the son of a high-ranking military official and his wife. Um, made me very nervous because at the time, they, he came in and all formal in his uniform and they put the child in front of me and we were in a conference room and all I had was a projector and napkins and candy and food. And right away, I, you know, what am I going to do? I have no toys. I have nothing. I don't speak Mandarin. Um, so I just got on the floor and started playing with them. The same things we do with all little kids that age. Tickles and bubbles. I didn't have bubbles. So instead, I blew the napkin up in the air and started doing little puppets and things. And pretty quickly, 
uh, it was clear that one, he, he sounded unusual. He wasn't really responding to me. He, it really took a lot to be able to get his attention towards me. And to be honest, I'll say I've never been more happy. That's not really a nice thing to say in that way, but never more thankful to see a more classic kind of presentation of autism because I knew, aha, I have an idea of how this little guy is operating and I can talk to the parents and help them because they were confused. And what really struck me was how, when we sat down to, to talk about what was going on with their little boy, the dad became a dad. The, the uniform went away. <laughs> he, he and his wife were all there focused on just trying to understand why is it so hard to communicate with their little boy and how can they do it better? And so that was so important important for me and hopefully for them. They had a long road ahead of them, uh, but trying to come to that understanding is particularly important. So another key aspect and a lesson that's very important, particularly when working in low and middle income countries is that we can't just do research for the sake of research. We have to think about the infrastructure. We have to think about why we're identifying people and what the purpose of that is. Um, and again, Li Ching was a model in that in her work in rural Taiwan uh, also brought her, well, initially she was there doing a prevalence study, but she also worked to uh, develop the home-based parent implementation intervention program. And that was really important because we have to think about where people are in their everyday lives and the importance of naturalistic behavioral interventions in that context. So where we are now is doing our best to follow up and uh, see the, the important study through that looks at air quality in the Beijing Olympics. This is the project that uh, Li Ching's tenacity and after multiple tries uh, in terms of, of writing grants and tweaking it and improving it, uh, we are now able to look at variations in air quality that were part of the restrictions that were put in for the 2008 Olympics, looking at um, various uh, periods of conception and then following up those children that are now young teens uh, at this time for follow-up for autism. Our amazing team in Beijing at Peking University have recently completed screening on 2,000 children and 150 assessments uh, in between COVID lockdowns and a very, really challenging context. Uh, and they're just an incredible group of people to work with. While we are doing a two-stage uh, screening and diagnostic assessment, another aspect that has been part of having a longer term collaboration with a group of incredible clinicians is that we're also trying to characterize and document clinical judgment. So not only what do the research tools say, but how does, how does this group assess a whole range of criteria and characteristics that we've identified across the whole battery, and how does that help us build a profile uh, for those individual children? So in conclusion, I just wanna say some of the key lessons that I've learned uh, besides what an incredible person Li Ching is, was, is that we have a lot to learn about how people with autism spectrum live around the world, but we have a lot in common that for those of us that may be coming from one context to the other, whether it's Western to Eastern or to another culture, we all need to have open minds, eyes and ears, particularly ears listening to the experience of the people who we are uh, forming a collaboration with. And that that true collaboration and partnership is really important. Another key, I think there's a move towards, and I hope this uh, certainly continues of having open source tools and interventions. That doesn't mean they can't be research-based. Unfortunately, research uh, is, is often financially driven as well, and the supporting the open source tools where we can spread this knowledge is really important. And to remember that as we talk about global autism research, the research really is uh, a way of opening up awareness, understanding, acceptance, and supports and services, and is meant to ultimately help people. And many people can't wait. So I want to thank Li Ching and our many collaborators, uh, and also Eric Rubenstein for his leadership in writing um, a wonderful tribute 
Dr. Lee Ching in the Autism Journal in 2021. Thank you. I think in um, recognition of time, we're going to take a quick two minute screen break and then we'll come back and we'll start the third session which will be focused on uh, mentees and we'll really highlight the research of two assistant uh, professors who Li Ching mentored uh, in their careers. So we'll take a two minute screen break and then we'll come back for the third session. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, our two minute break is over. We'll start again with the third session. Uh, and th this third section and session of the day uh, will focus on trainees. So, as you've heard throughout the day today, Leeching was incredibly devoted to mentoring and training and teaching. And so it was really important um, to the committee and her friends and colleagues and family that we feature some of her mentees research. And so I'm happy to introduce Eric Rubenstein, who will be our first presenter today. He's currently an assistant professor of epidemiology at Boston University. And then our second speaker right after Eric will be Dr. Aisha Dickens Dickerson, sorry Aisha, who's an assistant professor here in the Department of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health. This is actually one of Li Ching's favorite paintings, which is a huge uh, sort of mural uh, that has been broken down, at least for these online pictures, into eight different pieces. But um, her friends and colleagues said she would love to go back and visit the museums um, to see these paintings every time she would visit. Okay, Eric, you're up. Hi, everyone. Ooh, that moves in person and on the Zoom board. Um, I'm honored to be here today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that I'm doing now and how it's sort of been inspired by um, Li Ching. And um, I just realized this morning that I met Li Ching 10 years ago this week. So I came um, for Admitted Students Day for my MPH. Had a great day, was going to come to Hopkins, met all the great people, met with Danny, it was fine. 
Um, <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, we're upstairs having dessert. And like the highlight of my day at that point was how good the desserts were, which like you can see why Li, Li Ching and I were kindred spirits. <laughs> and Li Ching comes storming in the room saying, I just got off the phone with CNN. We just released the autism prevalence report. I can't wait to have you here. We're going to do so much. It's, it was like a tsunami entered the room and just everything was out of control. And she left the room and I was like, whoa. And that was the highlight of my day. Um, and really, um, I think I'm in the video. So I'll tell you more about um, how she's impacted my life in, in the video. Um, just to say that, that it's, it's really, um, she's, she's played a critical role in my life and, and I'm really happy to, to show how she's sort of um, inspired me. So um, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about some work that I'm doing in homelessness. So the US is in a housing crisis, um, as you may be well aware. Um, this is a somewhat old, this is a 2020 figure showing um, the number of people experiencing homelessness per 10,000 people. And you'll see some areas are more than others, but it's a big problem in the US, whether it's the lack of housing or systemic policies, we really have a struggle with this. Um, so for this talk, my terminology is gonna be a little all over the place. Um, it's kind of similar to what we see in the IDD, intellectual and developmental disability world, where we sort of person first language versus identity, identity first. Um, I'm gonna to try to say unhoused and experiencing homelessness to put the individual first, but in some of these phraseologies, it's just hard. So be patient with me. Um, so in conjunction with homelessness, there's um, uh, a high rate of disability in the school system. So using Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, 18% of students in public education receive special education services, which is slightly higher than the national average. Um, now that I'm at BU, I am a mass hole, so I'll be presenting results <laughs> specific to Massachusetts and some of our, our more preliminary work looking at other Northeastern states. Um, but nationally in 2019, 2020, 14% of students in public education um, had a special education eligibility um, with 11% of those students being autism. So um, that sort of this, this idea of education and prevalence is really driven from my work with Li Ching and the Adam Network. Um, this was one of my master's papers that she so um, generously trusted me to do, um, looking at special education eligibility. So my background in studying special education um, is driven from my time with Li Ching. Um, so back to the intersection of disability and homelessness in the schools. Um, there are federal laws that mandate that students experiencing homelessness and students with disabilities receive appropriate education. Um, so for homelessness, there's the McKinney-Vinto Act, which ensures students have equal access to public education. Um, and then the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, which makes available free and appropriate public education to children with disabilities from ages zero to 21. Um, we know in the adult population, there's a large overlap between disability and being unhoused. Um, and we could only until now speculate whether that overlap existed um, in children as well. And we made some, some ideas about why we might see this the case, where there'd be highest, higher rates of experiencing homelessness in children in the special education system. Um, family circumstances might lead to homelessness, which leads to disability. Um, for example, a child might need early intervention for subthreshold autism traits. And if the family can't afford those services, the child may not receive the services and then they might receive a special education um, diagnosis or classification. The child's disability might drive the family to financial difficulties. It's very expensive in the US to have a child with disabilities, especially um, ones that are very severe. So it might cause a family to lose on some material resource leading to being unhoused. And then sometimes the family circumstance might drive both the homelessness and the disability. Um, if you imagine a um, impairing car accident that leaves um, family members with a disability, which it causes a decrease in income might lead to both homelessness and disability, but not on the same causal arrow. So what we wanted to do was to use the existing data to document and describe the percentage of students experiencing homelessness who also received special education services in Massachusetts in 2017, 2017 and 2018. Um, that's been published and now we're working on adding additional Northeastern states so we can look at state level differences. Um, so we used the definition from the laws for homelessness and disability, which are definitely probably more narrow than the true underlying experience of homelessness homelessness or disability are. Um, 
they're listed here. And these are the special education eligibilities. So as I mentioned, autism is about 11%. Um, so the, all this data is publicly available, but um, until we set to link them together, it hasn't been linked before. So under the McKinney-Vento Act, the states have to submit data on children experiencing homelessness um, at the school district level. Um, they have to report number of students experiencing homelessness, number of students experiencing homelessness with disability, type of housing situation, English learner status, and migrant status. Um, and as Craig mentioned earlier about lacking denominators in those early autism papers, with these data, we don't have the denominators. Um, and we also don't have individual level data. So our results are sort of baseline limited there. The State Department though does, or State Department of Education does collect the data that can be used as denominators. Um, so they, um, states have to report the number of students that receive public education services. Um, so what we did is we linked the data, as simple as that. It wasn't, it was actually pretty simple. It was hard to find the data, but making the effort to do it um, took some time. And we calculated the percent experiencing homelessness among all students and the percent experiencing homelessness with and without disabilities. Um, and we calculated relative risk comparing the, you know, the risk of being unhoused for children with and without disabilities. And we mapped the results. So after our Massachusetts data, we added these additional states, which is just based on our availability to get publicly accessible data. All the states are supposed to have the data be um, accessible, but it really is not that easy to get them on the phone. So what we found was that um, in the 2017-2018 school year in Massachusetts, there were 962,000 enrollees, of which 24,000 experienced homelessness, which was about 2.6%. 18% 2 um, of students had a disability, and of those students with disability, 3.5% experienced homelessness, which gets us to a relative risk of 1.5. So the homelessness in Massachusetts in 2017-2018 was 50% greater for children with disabilities compared to children without disabilities. And we got some of these cool GIS maps. Um, this is students, the percent students with disabilities by district, with housing by district. Um, and then we can see sort of in Massachusetts and the Cape Cod area, we see kind of a concentration of the percent of students with disability experiencing housing issues. And then we looked at the disability ratio by county. Uh, so this is our, our preliminary work, uh, work in progress uh, for the additional states we see. Um, a range from 1.18% homeless ex with disability to 9.42 in DC, which sort of surprised me when we calculated it. Um, but our, our relative risks range from um, 1.34 to 4.76. So across the board, kids in special education are at greater risk of experiencing homelessness than kids without disability. Um, we see um, a slight increase over time in Massachusetts. Um, and as for our discussion, we, this is sort of cross-sectional data. So students experiencing homelessness were more likely to have a disability compared to peers, or conversely, students with disabilities were more likely to experience homelessness compared to peers. Um, we know we underestimate disability in our disability um, in the school system. We see a lot of racial disparities in who gets diagnoses for special education. Um, and we almost certainly underestimate homelessness. Um, it's really stigmatic for a lot of families, so they don't report it or let the schools know. Um, so we hypothesize that maybe the disabled and homeless group is undercounted because of limited time in schools, they're constantly moving, or maybe they're overrepresented because of diagnostic bias. A teacher might see a, children, a child that's experiencing homelessness and just assume that they must also have a disability. Um, so we need additional data. Um, what we want, these questions that we have, you know, coming up next, how do we serve these children, state related policy differences and how they make a difference. And then um, the data, our last set of data were 2019, 2020, just before the pandemic. So we would expect to see big changes. Um, for the sake of time, there were no limitations. Um, and I, I just want to close by saying that I've been fortunate to mentor an undergraduate named Emily Bach in this project. And so many of my ideas of what good mentorship is come from Li Ching. And you know, whenever in doubt, it's sort of what would Li Ching do? And um, I, I hope that I can deliver as a mentor to all my students as much as, as she delivered to me. Um, 
So that's it for me. These are some of my memories of Li Qing. You can feel free to ask because I know there's some sort of weird pictures here. Um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> rid of my background. <laughs> I had a pretty background on this title slide, but that's okay. So, uh, no, no worries. No worries. Um, so, I primarily wanted to talk about the fact that Li Qing was, y'all know I'm emotional. She was willing to help me. Sorry. Even though I wasn't one of her students. So think about the fact that <clears throat> I went to the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. It wasn't a big autism center. Like we didn't have a big Adam site or a seed site. But I knew that I wanted to do work on environmental risk factors for autism. So I came up with this project focused on ambient metal exposures and neurodevelopmental disorders. And I thought, I'll use the CDC's data. It's publicly available, right? And I think some people talked earlier, I know some people talked earlier about the Adam data and all of the wonderful papers that you can get out of Adam. But what they didn't say is that if you're not from one of these Adam sites, getting access to this data is a lot harder, a lot harder. as is evident by the fact that I only got data from five of those sites, five of the 14. But one of the first people to respond was Li Qing. And not only did she respond, she asked me, how can I help you get access to the data? I'm sorry. I'm primarily crying because honestly, I don't, I don't think I would have been able to graduate without Li Ching's help. <clears throat> but I want to tell you a little bit about the project. So using data from these five sites, I linked it to the EPA's publicly available data that included the toxics release inventory, which is just data from the EPA that tells you about all of the different um, industries that release toxicants into the air, water, and soil. And then there's the National Air Toxics Assessment, which will give you uh, an idea of the concentrations of different toxicants uh, within the air. So for my dissertation, I won't tell you when that was because uh, it was back before I had many shades of gray in my hair and these bags under my eyes. But just this, this uh, very, very preliminary ecological study, what I found was that there seemed to be an increased prevalence of autism in census tracts that had a greater portion of toxins release inventory sites in and around those census tracts. And then when I looked at the air pollution that was coming from those toxins release inventories, I really didn't see much with arsenic, which is to be expected because air is not the primary source of arsenic. Um, but what I did see was this increased prevalence of autism in areas that had a greater concentration of lead uh, or ambient lead. So eventually I did graduate. It took me a long time. <laughs> Again, primarily because it was difficult to get access to this data. And from there, uh, I kind of decided I wasn't doing autism research anymore. <laughs> I decided that my research would focus on uh, neurodegenerative disorders, but still on ambient exposures. And I kind of broaden that into occupational exposure. But from all the things that I learned from occupational exposure about occupational exposures and neurodegenerative disorders, I still was being pulled back into autism research. One of those reasons was because I kept going to the International Society for Autism Research meeting <laughs> and people like Danny and Heather and Chris and Li Ching would see me there and say, hey, you're still doing autism research. No, I'm not. <laughs> but um, when I was thinking about where I wanted to go for a faculty position, one of the primary things that I focused on was going somewhere 
where there are people that I considered friendly. And Lee Ching and Heather and Danny and Chris were here at Hopkins. So thankfully I landed at Hopkins. And so I did start doing autism research again. But um, even though I wasn't doing autism for so long, one of the things that I learned during my training and my, or my postdoctoral training was more about windows of exposure when you're doing assessments. And when you're thinking about autism, a lot of people tend to look at the third trimester and right after birth. But my thought was, you know what? People are exposed to a lot more things prior to birth and prior to the third trimester that tend to store up in bat, bone and in fat. And during the third trimester, both bone and fat will metabolize and then it can recirculate into the system and expose a child um, in utero. So I thought, let me look at exposures prior to pregnancy. Additionally, a lot of people tend to kind of put the focus on the mother, but I don't think it's the mother. I think it's not the mother alone anyway. It's a combination <laughs> of the mother's exposures and the father's exposure. So I got some funding from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences to use some registry data, um, including the Danish Pension Fund, which just tells you about every job anyone in Denmark has held from the age of 16 to 66. Um, and we excluded people who didn't have any parental occupation data. Um, so, cause we're looking at parents' occupation and autism and offspring. And then I used a job exposure matrix that I've been working with, I guess, for the last six years. Again, when I wasn't doing autism research, I was doing ALS research, and I was using these job exposure matrices for that. But now I'm applying those same matrices to parents' occupational exposures. Right now, uh, what I've done is categorized it into exposures before conception, during the first, second, and third trimester, and right after infancy. So hot off the presses, you guys are the first to see anything that I've done, any analysis on with this. Congratulations. Don't tell anybody. Uh, it definitely isn't close to publication yet because I'm still working out the kinks. But we excluded any children that didn't have any uh, parental occupation data. Uh, we only included singleton births. And then um, because this was matched, just my colleague did it that way, with ASD cases and... 100 controls without autism, we excluded any controls that no longer had a matched case once I did those other exclusion criteria. So here we go, are you ready? That's from my very first analysis with this data. So it's kind of wonky. Again, I'm still working out the kinks on it, but I did scale the axis so you all have a pretty picture. Overall, I haven't seen anything with parents' exposures to chromium, um, iron, or lead, but what I have seen is, and this is usually when I would wander over to the screen, but I know I'm doing this Zoom thing right now. What I have seen, let's see if this mouse works. No? Okay. Is, oh, it, Chris is trying to explain. You have it, to move it all the way across across the over across oh, all you know the screens. I'm not tech savvy. There you yeah, go. Keep going. going. Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay, there we go. So we did see a little bit of a trend. I can't get the mouse to move. Um, with nickel exposures, even though it's not statistically significant. But what I did see was this significant increase in odds for children whose mothers were exposed to welding fumes within the third trimester. Now, I know you all are looking at this strange little shape here. That's actually pretty common with occupational exposures due to the healthy worker effect. I won't bother explaining all of that to you right now. But we're looking at a variety of exposures because a lot of things are highly correlated with each other. Not so much with the males right now, but again, I'm working out the kinks and figuring out how to further analyze that. Um, the last thing I'm doing is looking at environmental exposures, health disparities and environmental justice issues. And I'm doing that using the ECHO data. So that's work with Heather Volk and Craig Newshafer. Um, but I started working with ECHO, primarily with work through Li Ching. So we were collaborating on a lot of projects um, when I first got to Hopkins. And because she was the autism expert, and when I got here, she said, now you also are the autism expert. <laughs> so we were collaborating on, um, on a few things. And this project in particular is looking at interactions between psychosocial stressors, environmental exposures, 
and risk of autism in offspring. But uh, going back to my work with Li Ching, um, right before she passed, we were working on a study that still hasn't been published yet. Oh my goodness. Anybody who works for ECHO knows the study I'm talking about. And um, I had to have a major surgery. So I just let her know, I won't have access to my email for the three hours that I'm on the operating table. Don't worry about it. And uh, she said, well, why don't you just put in your auto response that people should send me an email if they have a question? And I said, well, you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll be in the hospital for four days, but I'll have my phone. And she said, Aisha, don't answer the phone. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, when I was in the hospital, somebody called. I told them I was in the hospital. And they said, when will you have access to email? I need to send you something. So she was very adamant that she would handle everything while I was in the hospital. And a few weeks before she passed, we were supposed to have a cookie party. But maybe I'll have one just in memory of her later. But that's just, I just wanted to point out that as faculty, you find it difficult to help students when you don't get credit for it. <laughs> and, and she was willing to help me even though she got absolutely no credit. And so now that I'm faculty, I just, I'm hoping to, to try to be more like Lee Ching when I'm considering how to help students. So, that's it, I made my, I still have time left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Aisha. Um, we also have a short video from several other of Li Ching's mentees that we'd like to play now, and then we'll follow that with a short break until 4.20 p.m. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Lee. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And uh, how I first met Li Ching, um, I met her in 2004 when I started my master's of epi at Johns Hopkins. Uh, she was assigned to be my advisor. When I started, I was so new to epidemiology, I didn't even really know what a cohort study was. Um, that tells you how green I was then. Um, but at the time, I also didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. Nowadays, I'm a card-carrying epidemiologist and much of my work centers around autism epidemiology. And for that, I have primarily Li Ching to thank. Uh, Li Ching was one of the guiding influences, you know, in early part of my career. Besides the obvious fact, she was such an exemplary researcher who accomplished so much. There were two things about Li Ching uh, that really helped shape my trajectory. The first is excitement for her work um, in our meetings. Uh, her passionate enthusiasm for her work was so contagious. You know, it, it, it lit a spark in me and you know made me decide, oh, this is something I might want to do for myself. Um, the second thing I really remember about Li Ching was that she made me feel like I mattered. Um, like the thoughts and insight and whatever I had to say mattered. As a young person still new to the epi world, it was really amazing to feel this encouragement. She got me involved in papers, sponsored my trip to my first ever conference, and made me feel like I, I could contribute. And because of all that and so much more, um, I, I am where I am because of Li Ching. Some people change their life forever, and Li Ching is that person for me, without a doubt. She was the first person to show me that what I want to do in my career is possible. She took me under her wing, and she never let go. She taught me skills and a mindset and knowledge, and most of all, she gave me courage to achieve what I didn't think was possible. Um, and now uh, in medical residency, because of her, I know that I can push the boundaries and that I will change health systems for children and 
adults with developmental disabilities in low and middle income countries. I first met Li Ching uh, over the phone as a prospective student long ago. And I remember feeling, literally feeling through the phone, you know, how passionate she was about her work. But then it was um, later as a student and then as a TA with her in class, I, I learned that it might not have been the passion so much for the work I was feeling as it was for her students and her f potential future students, you know, no matter what their degree program was or whether they had the right answer. She, in, in every experience that I had with her in the classroom, her, her love of her students uh, was overflowing. And it always made me and I know other students feel really positive about myself, about the work I wanted to do. It made me feel supported and, and confident. And I know that uh, we all love her for that and, and we miss her for that. Dr. Li Qingli was my advisor when I was in the MHS program of the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins. Li Qing inspired my research interest in autism when I first saw her in a seminar where she introduced the work at Winniclark Center. After that, I began to work with her in several research projects. Li Qing taught me a lot in how to conduct epidemiology research as an experienced and excellent epidemiologist. I worked with her on my master's thesis. Li Qing gave me a lot of useful and brilliant suggestions in forming, uh, informing my research question, doing data analysis, and preparing the final manuscript. I also involved in her air pollution research project in China as a research assistant. When I worked with her, Li Qing not only taught me how to perform a strict epidemiology study design, but also emphasized the importance of collaborating with physicians and communities, which teach me a lot. Especially, um, I'm also I also plan to be an epidemiologist in the future. Moreover, Li Qing influenced my um, professional trajectory profoundly. Although she had a very, very busy schedule, she was still happy to uh, she was still happy with discussing my professional development with me. My name is Lydia Stewart Arts, and I had the honor of being mentored by Li Qing during both my master's and doctoral work at Johns Hopkins. When I reflect on my brightest memories of Li Qing, they are overwhelmingly memories that showcase her incredible kindness and enthusiasm for, I think, everyone she ever met. <laughs> um, she was frequently the kindest person, I would imagine, in most rooms she walked into. As her student, she made sure to start all of our mentorship meetings with the very genuine questions. How are you? How are you doing today? Is there anything taught in a class that you don't understand? Is there anything you need? And that care made me feel seen as a person first and a student and researcher second. My name is Semra Etiamas and I am a Turkish German psychiatrist and currently work as a research fellow at the Department of Psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University. I have met Li Qing when I um, was doing my MPH program at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2019, and she was my advisor throughout the program. I'm very grateful uh, to have met her. Um, she was an extraordinary person and inspiring teacher. She was very supportive and encouraging uh, mentor. She always shared her research ideas about um, children with autism and also supported me in my projects and uh, gave me the opportunity to collaborate with CDC. Um, I am very honored to have met her, um, Li Qing. Um, I miss you and you will be survived by your students, by um, the children with autism and by your research, what you have done. Hi, I'm Eric Rubenstein and this is Eva. And Li Qing has affected both my professional and personal trajectories in such ways that this little one wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Li Qing. Uh, getting involved in, in autism research and, and global autism um, not only led me to a fruitful career as an assistant professor in epidemiology at BU, but led me to, to meet my wife at the International Society for Autism Research, um, which ends up with how we got this little one. Um, and it really is um, 
It makes me sad that Eva not got, did never get the chance to meet Li Ching, but I know Li Ching um, would have loved to see her and feed her because she eats almost as much as Li Ching. I'm an assistant professor at Kennedy Krieger Institute and the Department of Mental Health here at Bloomberg School of Public Health. I completed my PhD and postdoc training here too, and had the great privilege of learning from Dr. Li Ching Li. To me, she was an educator, a collaborator, and a dear mentor. Li Ching inspired me and so many others through the way that she lived and she worked. She overcame a lot of difficulties in her life and yet always kept doing the important but difficult work, whether that was here in the US or abroad in Bangladesh or China. It seems like her view was that if something was inequitable, it needed to be worked on. And why not be the person to work on that? I think that's something that will I'll always take with me. The other thing about Li Ching is that she had such a kind and generous soul. She lifted up everyone around her. She was so encouraging. She treated everyone as her equal. I know that she made me feel like I belonged here. Being around her was like being enveloped in a warm blanket. I hope that in the future, when I mentor junior colleagues, I can share some of that energy in her honor. When I think of Li Ching, the first word that comes to mind is inspirational. She worked harder and was stronger than anyone I've ever known. She persevered through adversity and never gave up. She was selfless and humble, no matter her situation or success, and was so dedicated to making people's lives better, whether that person was a stranger or old friend. These amazing qualities are what shaped me into who I am today, both personally and professionally. She was my biggest cheerleader through my biggest life events, marriage, baby one, dissertation, baby two. It was a very hard decision to move on to another job after working with Li Ching for 15 years, and I know it was hard on her too, but still she cheered me on and supported me every step of the way. And during one of the last conversations I had with Li Ching, which was through text, she told me she was proud of me. I still look back at that text and it fills me with joy and reminds me of how blessed I am to have had Li Ching as a mentor, confidant, and friend. Okay, we'll take a short screen break now until 420. And when we come back, we'll have a discussion panel with some mentees as well as mentors.
to my other better Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this will be the start of our discussion panel for mentoring and training. Our moderator will be the uh, chair and professor of mental health, who is soon to become the dean of Emory University, Danny Fowler. The whole university. What? What did I say? The whole university. The whole, Just the school of public Emory health. Emory School of Public Health. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long flowers. It's getting all serious. I can't think of And then we have three panelists. We have uh, Dr. Irva hertz picciotto and Brian Lee. They are both joining us virtually um, and will be here um, responding to questions. And then we also have Snow, who is a master's student here, an advisee um, to represent mentees um, of Lee Shanks. And I should say Brian Lee as well, as you saw, was also a mentee of Lee Shanks. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Danny, to start. And then hopefully, Irva and Brian, if you can try to unmute yourselves. I'm hoping that works. Great. Looks like you're good, Ir Irva. Okay. Hear me? Great. Great. And we can hear you in the room. And can you hear okay. me OK? Great. Yes, we yep. can hear you both. And then folks on Zoom, can you hear us at this table? Yes. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. This has been, we were just saying in the break, a such a wonderful thing that we finally got to do both in person and online to celebrate such a great colleague um, as hard as it has been for the last several hours it's also been really wonderful um, this part we don't intend to take too long but we thought it would be great to just have a little bit more informal um, interaction you've heard today just what an incredible mentor Li Ching was to so many people at so many stages in their career and we wanted to then invite a group of folks, um, including very recent mentees like Snow Chu, as well as um, you know a little bit more um, distant mentees in Brian yeah. Lee, and then Irva, who was a mentor for Li Ching, and so you see kind of the the generations from how you know Irva's relationship with Li Ching and then Li Ching's relationship with others, and so we thought we we will. Um, seed maybe a couple of questions for the three of our panelists to answer from their respective points of view and then open it up if any of you in the room or on the chat have a, a quick question about uh, mentoring um, please feel free that's why chris is here to read the chats but anyone in the room can also raise your hand mm -hmm. so why don't we just start with i think a, an obvious but important question and that was what what do you think were the qualities of Li Ching's mentoring um, that were you know particularly salient for you and your experience? And I know we've heard those already, but um, can you answer that in the context of what other faculty or mentors could learn from that? So, what did you find so important about her mentoring that you would like to communicate to others um, so that we can become better mentors? And you want to start, start now? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, use this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, for me, uh, I met Li Qing when I was a master student here. And uh, uh, as I said in the video, uh, her introduction to the Wendy Clark Center in that seminar inspired me to uh, focus on the research in autism. And uh, that's why I became a PhD student in the Department of Mental Health to continue the work. Um, for me, um, eating is very supportive, and I mean, as a um, advisor for a master student, the main focus is her uh, master thesis. Um, as a outstanding epidemiologist, uh, Li Qing taught me a lot in that uh, area to how to apply the epidemiology and the biostatistics in my uh, master thesis. But she uh, gave me not only about the master thesis. I mean, she, as a mentor, she really care about my professional development. She has a very busy schedule, but she spent a lot of time to have mentor meeting with me. At uh, every uh, at the beginning of every mentor t uh, mentor meeting, she always asked me what you need from me and uh, uh, what I can do for you to explore your career interest or your research interest. And uh, she encouraged me to do to try a lot of different things. Uh, she asked me if you want to do a, a teaching assistant. 
I haven't think about it before as an international student. I mean, English is not my native language, but Li Ting says you can try it. You can, you will learn a lot from it. So I do it, and I did the TA job for the IP course seven. Uh, 721 in the course in the school and uh, thanks to that uh, experience I'm continuing to serve as a tutor for uh, epidemiology in the Department of Mental Health now and she offered my offers opportunity to become a research assistant for her and she uh, introduced the, the Wendy Clark Center internship for me so that I can get that uh, so excellent experience and also, as um, when I decided that I want to apply for a PhD, uh, for a PhD program, she gave me a lot of uh, useful suggestions, taught me how to prepare for the uh, interview and what I should do for that application. Uh, so thanks to her help, I explored many different things when I was in that master program. And uh, all those kind of things helped me to decide my career interest and my research interest. That's why I know what I'm going to do in the future. So I think it's more important than just a, a master status, what's the uh, advisor, um, I mean, the duty of the advisor for a master student. Um, okay. Sorry about that, Snow. Thank you so much, Snow. <laughs> Brian, how about you? Um, wow, th th there's a lot to think about. So yeah, I, as as I mentioned in the video, I first met Li Cheng in 2004, and I guess I was one of her uh, first mentees um, at Hopkins. And um, it, it's kind of funny thinking back about it now, but I realized Li Ching may actually have been the first academic mentor I had in my career because up until that point, um, you know, through through high school and college, advising and mentorship weren't really a thing. Um, it, it felt it, like thinking back, all of those relationships I had were purely transactional in, in terms of, oh, there's a form I need to get signed. Um, what course should I take? Um, and, you know, these are the kinds of things that take 30 seconds to do. Um, and sure, the, the, the former, the, the past mentors I've had, um, you know, before Li Ching were, were fine in their own way, but Li Ching really sort of opened my eyes and actually, I think, went out of her way to develop a relationship with me. And to me, that was... Um, incredibly important I uh, like sorry uh, yeah I, I she just made me feel like 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 a person that 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 mattered and that she she was interested in my well-being and my future and my development and and that took you know the mentoring relationship to another level and it's it's something that i've appreciated and uh, wanted to always you know pay forward to my my mentees that i have thank you so much brian and irva as her mentor maybe you can flip it a little bit into what are you know attributes of students or mentees that make for a good relationship um, and that, you know, what Li Ching particularly brought out in that regard. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, by the way. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer that question. Um, Li Ching had um, a fierce persistence that was just non-negotiable. <laughs> She was, she really knew where she was going and um, was going to get there. And so it, that was just, it was, it was, it was really a pleasure to be a mentor for somebody who um, was so directed and so driven and yet so, as everybody has said, warm and fun to be to talk to and and be around but she had lots of questions she was um all, you know asking for answers 
uh, and um, and she followed through. Um, she t she took. Uh, there were two classes of mine that she took. One was was our um, our final uh, uh, core curriculum uh, methods class. Um, there were very few. She was in the maternal and child health uh, department, and uh, very few of those students took that class of mine. So uh, you know that was impressive already. Uh, and then uh, I gave a, a course. It was a sort of the beginnings of the causal methods getting into the literature for uh, epidemiology and. I co-taught a course with Claire Weinberg, and uh, and she took that class. I remember she, uh, students were asked to do certain kind of presentations of topics, and and she was just right out there. I mean, you know, she was smart. She was really smart and really picked things up, um, and and took them and ran with them. And uh, I I had kind of forgotten about a paper that she that uh, you know I was on that was part of her um, dissertation on maternal depression and uh, child behavior problems. And um, during the session, <laughs> during one of the breaks, I, I, I pulled it up um, and it, it was really a, a, a model paper of, of how she um, you know, explained in very clear, simple language, the, ver the complexities of this effect modification that she saw um, based on maternal depression and, um, and the relationships to um, to different kinds of um, uh, behavioral issues. Um, so yeah, just somebody who engaged and was passionate. Um, you know, one thing she confided to me that that, that was came as kind of a surprise. Um, I guess um, maybe just having lived a, a lot of time in in California, where disability uh, rights were, were had been have been um, a, a point of of attention for for many decades um, that when she was a child um, her disability was a shame for her parents and uh, that you know going out in public with her like was for them um, you know made them feel ashamed of her. And it was just such a shocking thing to think about a young child growing up with that, carrying that kind of burden. Um, and she overcame lots of, lots of things. And, and that was one of them. And um, it, it was, uh, yeah, that, that was really, for me, kind of a, a real eye opener. Uh, but she was tough and she was just a beautiful person. Thank you so much, Irva. How about for Brian um, or Snow, who will someday be a mentor to others uh, and already to more junior students. Uh, what are, if you could think about one or two things that are particular um, behaviors or skills as a mentor that you want to emulate or that you already emulate that you learned from Lee Ching? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start here. Um, I, th I think one of, one of the things I, that really made Li Ching stand out when I think about my advising is just how to work with your mentee's intellectual energy. Um, and to, to you know, I, I don't think harness is quite the right word, but, you know, just like foster and promote it and sort of like help guide it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I see sometimes out there in the academic advising world, some sort of less healthy relationships where uh, mentees just sort of get put onto mentors projects without any sort of feedback and, and, and sort of, you know, like, hey, I wanna do this. No, you should be doing this instead. Um, I think what Li Ching, you know, offered to me when, when I first started out was almost like a sort of like buffet of, uh, you know, research. And, and it wasn't even in the sense that like, you know, I, I, I had to do any of this and she wasn't even necessarily trying to recruit me per se, but I think just by virtue, like showing me like some options out there, I was able to sort of focus my own interests and say, hey, you know, this particular thing 
um, appeal to me. And so like, for example, um, even though my dissertation had like zero to do with autism research, I got involved in a side project um, looking at the birth seasonality of autism. And this is like a, um, you know, a decades long thing in, in at least in my career, uh, like a intellectual pursuit that Li Ching um, was so excited about and so in, interested in. Um, and, you know, she got me as a little old master student who at that point, I think was still working through the basic FE curriculum um, I may ha not have even taken survival analysis at, at that point, um, but you know, she she that didn't discourage her from like saying, "Hey, you know, you can contribute to this." Um, and so, you know, long story short, I roped in one of my cohort buddies, uh, Justin Lessler, who's um, now a professor at UNC, um, but we ended up contributing. Um, you know, as co-authors on this first seasonality of autism paper, um, and that, uh, you know, was my very first autism paper, I think, in um, the, the late 2000s. Thanks so much. Snow, anything you're, you'll take from this into your mentorships? Yeah, um, I think first, as Brian says, okay. um, so first I learned from Li-Ting is um, respect the idea from students, even though you are not familiar with it, <laughs> but um, you can work with the students together to get something new. And um, yeah, Li-Ting didn't say that, oh, you should do this, or mm, I think this is the best for you, blah, blah. But um, she uh, listened to the ideas from my own um, interest and uh, tried to help me to develop from it. And uh, the second thing I learned from it is like to um, provide your student um, more opportunity to uh, communicate with other uh, people, not only in the academia, but also community and uh, uh, even like collaboration with physicians. Because uh, uh, I remember when I was a research assistant for her, and one time the China uh, team came here to have a visit to the many KKI Institute. Actually, it's a not tour like for the RA, but Li Qing invited all the RA to, uh, to join that tour. And I uh, learned a lot from it to see like how the special school in KKI, special education school in KKI work. So it's um, really give me many new ideas about my research and my career uh, interest. Great, thanks so much. Any questions in the chat for her mentees or mentor? What about folks in the room? Anything that you would like to hear from their perspectives? Yes, JJ. Do you mind coming? So um, I remember Brian B, um, just because there was uh, the Chin's early career, right? She just joined Hopkins and she was really excited about seeing Grace students. So I kind of that that's her, oh, that's her spirit, you know, um, willing to work with someone. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, it's a student, it's faculty, always someone on the street. So I think that's just her, you know, general generosity to, you know, anyone. But I, I do remember Ryan Lee, you know, I remember Lee Chin was talking about him a lot, like <laughs> early meetings, something like that, and talk about, you know, you know, the breakfast, you know, they had breakfast together. I remember those. You know, I never met Brian um, personally, but I did hear about um, a lot about his stories. It's like, nice to meet you. Any others have questions? All right, I just want to make sure there's space for others. Anyone? Yeah, got it. You do. Can you okay. have a comment um, from Fran Berman that Li Ching always treated trainees as colleagues and rejoiced in their ideas? You're here. Thanks, Fran. Mm -hmm. And I think I can comment as her co-instructor on the course for many years. You know, on my video, I said she was a fan favorite. I mean, that's, you know, an understatement by far. She cared so much about um, didactic teaching as well as these one-on-one -on -one mentorship opportunities. And she, you know, would be relentless in improving her slides every year and making sure people understood. And um, no question was was too naive or too long. So especially in our summer institute, there would be, you know, sort of really long questions because that was the only time these students had with us were these these couple of events. 
And she was just not only patient, but eager. You know, it wasn't like she was like, oh, okay, get through it. She was, no, no, keep going. I want to hear, I want to understand, I want to be able to help. And she was thrilled when there were students from across the world. Um, she would text me at night and be like, did you see we have another Japanese student? You know, did you see? Like, you know, she just really was so enthusiastic that um, we had that kind of reach. Uh, so it was a joy to get to teach with her. Right. Oh my and gosh, so sorry, I, I have to jump in because I, this reminds me of another uh, memory I have because um, remember when I said I was talking about like her sort of guiding my intellectual energy um, she also knew how to like put a stop to it when I was like clearly jumping into something I didn't know like that like at all what I was doing. So um, the, the bright idea I had like in 2004, I think, well, it was like, oh, surely there must be some medications out there that cure autism or treat autism. You just haven't been discovered yet. So I, and then she's like, well, you know, may, maybe we should like take a step back. Um, and then, so at this point, you know, you know, I was expecting, you know, like the rational person who's not as kind might be like, well, why don't you Google and do some PubMed searching on your own time? She, no, no Li Ching actually mentored a one-on-one -on -one reading course with me to learn about um, medications that were being used in uh, trials to, you know, test whether or not they were, uh, interventions for autism. And this is something like as a junior faculty, I would have been horrified to have been saddled with a one-on-one -on -one reading course with a student who literally knows nothing about this topic. And you know, she <laughs> she, she she did this for me. Um and she got nothing in, in return. Um, you know, like there was no published paper or anything. There was um, all, all the, the only person that benefited from this was me as the student, um, and, and that was it. And I, I think that exemplifies, you know, just how how selfless and and generous Li Chen was with her time. Thank you so much, Brian. That's a great um, testimony to Li Ching and her um, role as an educator. Um, which is what we were hoping you get out of this session. So thank you all for participating uh, in the panel. And I'll hand it back to Chris, who's gonna have closing remarks. Thank you, Snow. I think he'll turn them off, but yeah, we can. Okay. So before my final um, closing re remarks, we have a um, sort of live tribute and some remarks by Mike Clagg, who is Dean Emeritus of our Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and whose late wife, Wendy, our school's center for autism is named after. So Mike, um, the it, ball's in your court. <laughs> thank you, Christine. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there today with you. Uh, I do wanna thank everybody who made this, uh, this wonderful celebration possible. It was, it was a accurate, you know, uh, loving, uh portrayal of what Li Ching's life was the person she was and the, and the life she lived and um I, I I enjoyed it so much it was great so thanks to everybody who contributed so much you know a lot's been said about her uh commitment to mentorship and I just want to point out that she not only mentored students and and you know colleagues she mentored deans as well and <laughs> In, in 2014, I, got, I received an invitation to speak at a WHO regional meeting in Bangladesh on autism. And it's a kind of funny story how I got invited because I certainly am not an expert in autism, but I, I, uh, I accept it. And I tried to find data on prevalence of autism in low-income countries. And I couldn't find anything. So, so I reached out to Li Ching and she told me about the study that we've heard about that she was collaborating with Peru and Keith and the whole Javita group in Bangladesh to do a, the first prevalence study and, and to do a non-concurrent prospective study. And, um, and so she sent me some really helpful slides and, uh, and talked through some things. And then by coincidence, she was in Bangladesh when I was giving that talk. So she came and, and Kathy Rice came to the talk uh, with these ministers of health, they, they let them in. And, uh, you know, that day I, uh, uh, Margaret Chan came, I met her, and then we had, I had dinner with the president of uh, Bangladesh. It was all wonderful. 
But the most special part of that day I remember was sitting with Lee Ching and, and Kathy and talking about autism and, and the issues and, and uh, what needed to be done. And it was, it was a very helpful conversation in, in terms of uh, my thoughts as Dean about what we needed to do as a school. So, um, so it, was, it, it was wonderful. I, I do wanna say that uh, Lee Ching is a person who added so much uh, to our school in many ways. And when I came back from, uh, from my sabbatical, I got an office on the sixth floor, thanks to David Chilantano. And, and it turned out that Lee Ching's office was right down the hall. So I would see her all the time and we related in a completely different way. And I, I perceived that interest and loving care that she gave everybody it was really wonderful. So, um, so I'm happy to be here to be here with you to celebrate and to talk about what a wonderful person she was. So thanks for doing this, Chris. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mike. And I also want to thank the event planning committee. So a number of folks, um, JJ Lee, her niece, Kathy Rice, Eric Rubenstein, Danny Fallon, and Michelle Landrum for the help planning this event, um, as well as others not listed here, Jamie um, and Margaret as well for helping organize today. Also, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize, we talked a lot today about Adam and the work that Lee Ching did there and being the longtime PI on that. Um, and I really wanna thank Drs. Elise Pass and Danny Fallon also for stepping up and really taking ownership of that and making sure that work continues to move forward as well. So thank you for that. And then finally, um, I also wanna thank the Departments of Epidemiology and Mental Health, the leadership, um, as well as the academic office and support that she received in all of her research and her um, teaching capacities here. And then we also wanna thank um, several generous sort of donors and in particular, um, Dr. Andy Simmerman and his wife, Susan Connors, um, who set up a term uh, scholarship in Lee Ching's memory. Um, to support master's and PH international students with financial hardship, so thank you. And there's also many friends, family, colleagues, and collaborators um, who have donated to the Wendy Clagg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities um, in her name for use in supporting students. If you're interested in making a gift to either of these, um, support either of these efforts, the information is at the bottom of this slide on how to do that. And then in addition, we only had time to play a very short snippet of all of the tribute videos that were contributed in Lee Ching's honor. Um, there are many full length videos with many, many more people and hours worth of material um, that we will point you to with this um, QR code or using the link down below that you can watch in your own time. It's part of our, um, is it Wendy Clagg YouTube uh, video site? So you might have to scroll down to the bottom of the page to find those videos, but they're all there um, for you all to watch. And then finally, um, we have something special that we would like to present to Li Ching's family. Um, and this is really a um, family tree of all of the mentees that Li Ching um, had during her time. So JJ. And yes, we know she was, as you've heard, incredible teacher and so dedicated to her students and mentees and all. Uh, we wanted you to have this. And then finally, it wouldn't be the end of a day celebrating Li Ching without hearing um, from Li Ching herself uh, a little bit about, um, in her own words, reminding us why we do this work every day. And so I'm gonna play a short video from a campaign um, of Li Ching from a Pathfinders for Autism nonprofit group. If I can get the, there we go. Hello, my name is Li Ching Li. I'm the principal investigator of the Artisan and Developmental Disability Monitoring Network in Maryland. 
This project is funded by the U.S. CDC to provide a comparable population-based estimate of autism prevalence over time. The number is currently reported as 1 in 68 children. So what does autism awareness mean to me? It means whether you are one of the 68 or 67 of the 68, you are unique, special, and precious. Okay, thank you everyone.